introduce uh, uh, our worthy speaker. Uh, I, I missed out on uh, introducing myself yesterday. Uh, my name is Ali Mustafa. I'm a lecturer at the Department of Strategic Studies at the National Defense University, um, mainly teaching courses on uh, non-proliferation, arms control, and disarmament. Uh, and I'm really honored to be uh, the moderator of this session today. Uh, and I thank the team at uh, Stratfor Asia, especially Dr. Adil Sultan and his worthy team uh, in allowing me this opportunity. Uh, so with that, I'm going to introduce our speaker, Ambassador Zamir Akram. Uh, he was Pakistan's ambassador and permanent representative to the UN and other international organizations in Geneva from 20, uh, 2008 till 2015, during which Ambassador Akram played a leading role in areas such as human rights, refugees, humanitarian affairs, trade and development, intellectual property, labor and health, among others. As a career diplomat, he served in several vital posts, including the former Soviet Union, India, and United States twice, as well as the United Nations twice as well. And he has dealt with key issues, including Afghanistan, uh, nuclear non-proliferation, arms control and disarmament, as well as UN reforms as well. And if I, if I may uh, say so, um, Ambassador Akram is one of the finest diplomats that Pakistan has produced, certainly one of the best in his generation, uh, without a shadow of a doubt. With that, I would uh, uh, give the floor to the ambassador uh, to please uh, give his remarks for 40, 45 minutes, and then we will open up uh, the session for Q and A's. With that, thank you so much, Ambassador Akram. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, for your kind words, which are beyond my CV that I shared with you. So I, I thank you for your your uh, kind support. Um, I also want to thank Staff for Asia and in particular uh, Adil, my friend, for uh, inviting me participate uh, in this very important uh, workshop and uh, today <clears throat> to clarify that what I'm going to be saying are purely my own personal views and they don't reflect the views of the government or any other organization of the government. Uh, so to begin, <clears throat> let me talk a bit about what I see as the emerging geostrategic environment. Actually, in my view, what we are witnessing is the emergence of, of a new world order. And judging by uh, the situation around the world and different parts of the world, uh, this uh, transition uh, to a new world order is several things. It's, it's primarily, I think it's very dangerous uh, because there is a considerable amount of violence associated with this as we are witnessing in Ukraine and other parts of the world. It's also very complex and volatile. And uh, therefore, the international system that we are uh, witnessing as being unstable. And that instability is characterizing uh, the relations between the major powers as well as in different parts of the region, uh, especially uh, in, in our region, in Asia, as well as in the Middle East and in Europe. So I will come to that in a bit. But first, let me talk about what I mean when I say a new world order is emerging. What we see very clearly is increased competition. In fact, confrontation between the United States and Russia uh, as in Europe, as also between the United States and China in the larger Asia Pacific region, but not only confined to these parts of the world, but also in other areas of the world. And so there is an impact of this competition and confrontation between the major powers on the key regions, as I said, as well as on global and regional stability, which as I said, is extremely volatile at the present time. And if we look in the foreseeable future, I see this turbulence 
uh, as being con as continuing in the uh, years ahead because of policies that are being pursued by the major powers, and I will come to, come to that in a bit. The final point I want to say on this particular aspect uh, of this new world order is that we can argue or we can, a, a case can be made that a new Cold War has started. This is a different kind of Cold War, not the kind that we saw between the United States and the erstwhile Soviet Union since the Second World War, but a Cold War which involves not two, but several powers. Big powers like the United States, Russia, China, as also smaller powers, regional powers, are also vying uh, for a greater role at the global level and particularly also in their respective environments. So I would say that this is the beginning of a new Cold War, which as I said earlier, is complex, it is volatile, and it is unstable. Now, what is the Genesis. I want to focus uh, to understand this transition uh, better. I think it's it's good to to take into account the genesis of this new world order that we are talking about. I would say that this process towards the emerging geostrategic environment started with the collapse and disintegration of the Soviet Union in 1991, which led to the emergence of the United States as the sort of sole superpower, the most dominant global power in the world, in which the power equation was dominated by power. So we were talking, we can say that this was a period from 1991 onwards of a unipolar world. And it also signaled the end of the old Cold War between the, between the United States and the erstwhile Soviet Union. <clears throat> now, at that time, in 1991, there was an opportunity, I believe, for the major countries led by the United States to evolve a just and equitable international order based on the U UN Charter's principles and acceptance of the other major countries as equal partners and equal players at the global level. It was also an opportunity to resolve longstanding regional disputes uh, in different parts of the world, in Europe, in Asia, and elsewhere, the Middle East. But unfortunately, particularly after the administration of the first American, uh, the first Bush presidency, the elder Bush, when that ended, and he was uh, succeeded by President Clinton, we have witnessed the opportunity for this just and equitable order being squandered. And for that, I blame the United States. Why do it? Because the U.S. believed at that time that it had won the Cold War against the Soviet Union, it had defeated the Soviet Union, and it was not just a political victory, but also an ideological victory in the sense that the U.S. believed that the principles that it espoused of of democracy, uh, free market economy, etc., uh, had won over the controlled eco economic system that the Soviet Union had espoused around the world. So we had intellectuals, or people considered as intellectuals, like Fukuyama talking about the end of history, and others talking about the clash of civilizations, and some others also talking about the beginning of an American century when the United States would dominate the world and its uh, ideals, its principles, etc., cetera, uh, would be acceptable across the board. However, the manner in which this was pursued 
was and still remains a zero sum game, a zero sum policy that has been pursued by succeeding administrations in Washington from Bill Clinton to the present time. And ideas and policies that characterize this period were such as policies of preemption and unilateralism, policies of requiring that there should be a rules-based international order in which the rules would be determined by the United States and its partners. And that now, in more recent times, uh, the US has been talking of American exceptionalism and the Biden administration has now been advocating a pursuit of the supremacy of democracy over autocracy uh, for which it blames its opponents. So if you look at the national security policy papers, the national security strategies of all the uh, American administrations uh, since Clinton to the present, they have all been defined by the objective of preserving, promoting, and ensuring American global supremacy. This has translated into several negative developments during this period from 1991 onwards. There was the first Iraq war, then of course, uh, failure to resolve the underlying problems in the Middle East led to almost 20 years of the war on terror and regime change, policies of regime change which were pursued in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, in Iraq, in Libya, Syria, and elsewhere. Accompanying this trend was to contain and where necessary confront the power, the growing power of other peer countries, other peer powers like China and Russia. With regard to China, we saw in the mid 20, mid 2000s, the American policy under the Biden administration called the pivot to Asia. And this policy has been now uh, in, in force with the creation of regional alliances such as the quadrilateral alliance involving the United States, Australia, Japan, and India, as well as more recently, the AUKUS alliance between the United States, the United Kingdom, and Australia. This approach has been not only to contain China in the larger uh, Asia Pacific region, but also extended to interfere in China's internal affairs, such as regarding Taiwan, Hong Kong, and even Xinjiang, which are all red lines for the Chinese, because the Chinese are willing or unwilling to accept any interference in what they consider as their internal affairs. In Europe, the United States has pursued an incremental expansion of NATO eastwards towards Russia. This has led to confrontation with the Russians, which we first saw in 2008, when the Russians reacted to efforts for including Georgia in the NATO alliance by militarily intervening in Georgia. And similarly, in 2015, in response to the regime change that was brought about in Ukraine and efforts to include Ukraine in the NATO alliance. So again, in 2015, the Russians reacted uh, to that, to those developments. And yet again, uh, we have seen the same Russian response by its intervention in Ukraine in 2022. So 
when we look at the global scenario, the United States has simultaneously confronted China in its backyard in the, in the Asia Pacific while confronting Russia in Europe, threatening from the Russian perspective, uh, Moscow's interests. Obviously, <laughs> such policies have led to a reaction and over time, the Russians and the Chinese have grown closer through their strategic partnership agreement, as well as the creation of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization in Central Asia. Now, what we are witnessing in Ukraine is that the Russian intervention in that country has elicited the support and understanding of the Chinese because of their strategic partnership between these two countries. The Sino-Russian objective is rejection of the US-led unipolar order and pursuit of a multilateral international order in which the rules of the game are not to be determined by the United States and its partners, but by the other two powers as well. And uh, both the leaders of uh, Russia and China have been very clear in this. President Putin and uh, Xi Jinping have been very clear in arguing that no country can impose its policies, can impose its preferences on the rest of the world, and that the only order that needs to be recognized at this time is that the world is composed of multiple number of powers, and that this relationship between these powers should be based on the Charter of the United Nations, not on what the Americans would call a rules-based order by them. So this is the impact of the developments that have taken place globally uh, since 1991 to the present time. Now, while China has grown uh, in its economic and subsequently in its military power, especially you can say when China became the second largest world economy in 2008, and since then has under President Xi Jinping followed a more assertive policy to protect its interests, especially in the Asia Pacific, and more specifically in the South China Sea and the East China Sea. The reason is obvious because 80% of China's shipping passes through this region, through the Indian Ocean and to the Pacific Ocean, through this Straits of Malacca, which are key to, to China's economic and military uh, capabilities. And so the Chinese have responded aggressively, assertively, to the growth of the Quad and the AUKUS, and China's spokesmen, spokespersons have been on record as having clearly described the quadrilateral alliance as an Asian NATO. And uh, therefore, they have been building up both their uh, economic and military capabilities, including the PRI or the, the Belt and Road Initiative, of which CPEC, as you know, is a major power, as a major part, in response to the American-led containment of China. The Chinese have also been building up their military capabilities, especially their naval capabilities uh, that they have deployed in the Indo-Pacific, uh, in the so-called Indo-Pacific region. 
On the other side, in Europe, as I said, the incremental expansion of NATO has held out a challenge to Russian security because historically, from the Russian perspective, their security has always been undermined by countries on Russia's west, by France under Napoleon, by Germany under Hitler, and now by the United States and the NATO alliance uh, in Ukraine, which is why the Russians have responded with such great uh, degree of force uh, against the uh, the efforts to incorporate R Russia, uh, incorporate Ukraine in, into the NATO alliance. What they are trying to do, I think, is to build a buffer zone in the eastern part of Ukraine, the so-called Donbass region, between Russia and the rest of in which the NATO, led by the United States, is present uh, in heavy uh, military uh, contingents with uh, deployments of NATO uh, forces, deployment of NATO weaponry uh, all along Russia's uh, borders in, the, in its Western uh, sector. So Russia now is again a power that has, has resurged. There has been a resurgence in Russian power. It is no longer the Russia of President Gorbachev or President uh, Yeltsin. Under Putin, the Russians have taken a strong line, uh, not just in, in Europe, but also in the Middle East. If you see the Russians uh, absorbed or accepted American interventions in, in Iraq, in Libya, but they drew a line when such intervention took place in Syria. And then for that reason, the Russian um, military presence has been uh, prevalent in Syria for some time. Now, while the, the Russians and the Chinese have grown in terms of their power capabilities, as well as in terms of their global influence, uh, American power, although the United States is still the world's most powerful country, and spends more on defense than the next nine or 10 countries put together. The fact is that relative American power has been declining. Part of it has been due to the limits of this power resulting from their misadventures in Afghanistan, Iraq, and elsewhere, which has been estimated to have cost the United States over $3 trillion. And the American uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan in unfavorable conditions, shall we say, has put a dent in its prestige globally and also in its reliability for its partners outside of Europe, particularly in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. As a result of which, all these countries in these regions are beginning to look at alternatives, alternative options. And this brings me to the regional impact, uh, regional aspects of the emerging uh, geostrategic environment. I believe that the great power competition, <clears throat> let's take Asia first. The great power competition in Asia provides both challenges and opportunities for Asian countries in varying degrees. It is challenging because it is forcing countries of Asia to choose sides, which they do not necessarily want to do. It is also heightening regional tensions. Now, let me give you some examples. A very clear example of forcing countries to choose sides is our own country. We have had a history of close strategic relations with China. And 
good cooperative, co cooperative relations with the United States. But this competition between the US and Russia, the US and China and Asia is forcing us to choose sides which we would rather not do. Similarly, uh, India, which is now a, which has become a strategic partner of the United States, net security provider, etc., and part of AUKUS, aimed at containing and confronting China, has to choose in the present environment between its new ally, the United States, and its erstwhile old historic ally, the Soviet Union stroke Russia. And this presents the Indians, of course, uh, with, with difficult choices. It is also heightening regional tensions, as I say, as in the case, for instance, between China and India. Before, uh, I mean, ever since the independence of the two countries, China and India have had border problems in the East, in the east and, and, and in the West, in the, in, the, in the Ladakh and in the Arunachal area. But these disputes were controllable. They had gone to war in 1962, but after that they had come to a, uh, an arrangement by which uh, such disputes were not allowed to, to uh, be translated into actual fighting. But if in 2021, we see the emergence or re-emergence re of India-China clashes in the Ladakh region. And I would say a large part of that is due to the Indo-US strategic partnership, which has encouraged India to become more adventurous in its relation to China. Similarly, we are seeing regional tensions, as I mentioned, mentioned earlier, in the South China Sea, where uh, the US is propping up uh, not only the quadrilateral alliance countries, but also the literal and hinterland states of the South China Sea to pursue their territorial claims in that region against China. So in that region as well, we, we are seeing uh, tensions rising, and in particular, tensions rising between the US and China over Taiwan. Uh, and I, I was listening to a, a very knowledgeable China watcher, uh, Mr. Kishore Mabubani, a former diplomat from, from Singapore, uh, who very categorically said that the possibility of a confrontation, a military confrontation between the United States and China over Taiwan is a 100% possibility, is 100% certainty. So uh, we are obviously seeing a impact of this great power competition in our own region. Again, uh, another example of regional tensions is the close ties that have evolved between the United States and Israel on the one side and the GCC countries on the other side uh, aimed against Iran. So again, this kind of change that has come, uh, I would say historic change in the policies of the GCC countries uh, towards Israel is driven by the animosity that exists between Iran and the United States. And on the other side of the equation is the relationship that is, uh, has uh, solidified, has become, uh, has grown between Iran and Russia as you know, President Putin is, uh, was or still is in Iran, as well as between Iran and China. As you know, Iran and China have signed this 20-year agreement uh, on, on uh, infrastructure development, etc., cetera, in, uh, between the two countries. So this is the impact that we are witnessing uh, in Asia. Similarly, there are, at the same time, I would say, <laughs> benefits. These are the challenges, but there are also benefits uh, for the regional powers, depending on how adroitly, depending on how uh, skillfully these countries can manage the, uh, the, uh, the challenges as well as the opportunities that have arisen due to the competition between the great powers. And I think uh, 
India and Iran uh, have shown how they can uh, skillfully manage this to benefit. For instance, look at the Indian uh, position, despite being an ally of the United States, uh, it has not criticized the Russian in, uh, intervention in, in Ukraine, uh, but even more importantly, it has benefited from Russian exports of cheaper oil, gas, and other commodities, and is now poised, along with Iran, to establish a north-south oil pipeline from Russia via Iran to India, which will come up to the Jabar or one of the Iranian ports, and from there uh, either go by sea uh, towards, towards India. Similarly, as I said, Iran uh, has benefited because it is also a beneficiary of cheaper Iranian oil uh, or cheaper Russian oil and other commodities. Uh, it is uh, a beneficiary of Russian weaponry. And as I said, if they are, if this pipeline materializes, then of course uh, they will also be beneficiary of that in uh, Russia to India pipeline. And the GCC countries, I would say, have also played their card well, uh, because on the one hand, uh, they are uh, partnering with the U.S. to counter Iran, uh, along with uh, with the Israelis. But at the same time, they have not uh, abandoned their option of increasing their commercial relations, defense relations, uh, trade relations with uh, Russia and China. And uh, the recent example that you see of President Biden's visit to the Middle East, to the Gulf region, uh, the Iranians, uh, the, the Saudis and the UAE very clearly indicated uh, that while they will pursue uh, the relations with the US, they will not abandon their relations with either China or with Russia. So in this environment, apart from the bilateral uh, relations uh, that have been affected between the regional countries and the major three major powers, uh, there have also been growth of regional alliances and partnerships, sometimes in specific regions, sometimes in the broader international level. One very clear uh, example of these kind of uh, groupings is, of course, the BRICS countries, which is a disparate Brazil, South Africa, India, China, Russia, uh, that is emerging as a counterweight to the kind of policies that the US would like these countries to pursue. Similarly, I think we have an opportunity, at least, and I will come to that, I'll come more to that later, for Pakistan to evolve a similar partnership with China and Russia. Afghanistan and perhaps even Iran uh, to increase its regional connectivity as well as to try and address the Afghan situation, the instability in Afghanistan. So this is uh, these are some of the impacts or the or the outcomes of of uh, of the global environment on, uh, on, on Asia. Let me take. It to Europe now. <clears throat> now, here in Europe, if you read the Western narrative, the Ukraine war has solidified the NATO alliance and it has brought new members such as Finland and Sweden into the NATO fold. Um, but I would argue that this Western unity over the longer term can prove to be illusionary. The reason that why I say this is because of the rising costs of the Ukraine war on the European countries, especially for France, Germany, and Italy, which are heavily dependent on Russian oil and gas supplies for heating, use, etc. So this European dependence has proved to be a double-edged sword because on the one hand, the Western alliance thought that 
imposing sanctions on Russian products uh, would triple the, the Russian economy. But it has had the opposite effect because of clear uh, and clever policies followed by the Russian government. Uh, and so the burden of more expensive oil, more expensive gas, in fact, now that uh, Gazprom has shut down its uh, supplies, uh, complete denial of this very vital energy resource from Russia to the Europeans. And it is already pushing the European economies, the European public, and it remains to be seen how long the Europeans will be able to sustain uh, this kind of hard uh, uh, that they are confronting uh, this time. With the result that apart from the United States, the and which Ukraine, of course, is feeling, the Ukraine leadership is, of course, feeling the brunt. But the United States and UK are, hard, are not in the same degree of vulnerability as are the other European countries. And so they are quite insistent on continuing to fight the Russians to the last Ukrainian. Uh, and the Ukrainian leadership of Mr. Zelensky has so far uh, gone along uh, with that approach. But the other European countries, Fla France and Germany in particular, are very keen to find a political solution. And I would say, judging also from perceptive American uh, observers, Mr. Henry Kissinger is one of them, John Mearsheimer is another one, and there are several others. Uh, who are arguing that it's what is it's not important how the war or why the war Ukraine war started. What is important is, is how is it going to end? And and in the view of all these experts, uh, the war has to end by accommodating Russia's security interests in Europe. It cannot end otherwise. So. Effectively, uh, this is a phase. And as the Russians continue to advance in Europe, uh, in Ukraine, uh, that becomes more and more of a necessity for the rest of the political solution. Now, I have spoken about Asia, Middle East to a certain extent, and, and uh, Europe, but where the real uh, problems are, but you can see this kind of competition uh, in other parts of the world, Africa, America, uh, where the Chinese have made major inroads uh, with these African and, and Latin American countries. And there is a clear divide, say, in, in Latin America between those countries uh, that are aligned with the US, traditional US allies as part of the organization of American uh, states. And then those that are aligned with China and Russia, such as Venezuela, Cuba, Bolivia, and so many others. Uh, and then there are those in the middle, such as, uh, such as Mexico, and some of the other, uh, Brazil as another important player in this, uh, in this game. So all of these, uh, this is an impact. Uh, and similarly, we can say uh, there is such a similar impact in Africa, but possibly of time means that it goes into detail. So let me come to the last concluding part. I've, I've got a couple of minutes left. So, uh, and talk about, uh, about Pakistan, the implications for Pakistan. I think that Pakistan is facing two challenges or twin challenges as a result of this global development. The first is that the Indo-US strategic partnership cooperation against China has increased the security threat for Pakistan, because owing to this security cooperation, the US has helped, US and others like France, Israel and others have helped India's military capabilities to be increased and be modernized. This presents Pakistan with a security threat because the Indians can use this uh, power, not only it's not necessary that they will use it only against China, but they can also use it against Pakistan. The second problem is that Pakistan is increasingly faced with the need to balance its relations 
with China, with its relations with the United States. Now, there are certain key problems in the Pakistan-US relationship, which again will take us beyond our present scope. Uh, but the fact is that the Afghan war or the aftermath of the Afghan war has left the relationship in very bad shape. The U.S. views Pakistan as having played a double game of having stabbed the Americans in the back by supporting the Taliban and ensuring that the Taliban eventually defeated the U.S. That's the bottom line. And it's going to take a long time for us to be able to overcome that. But at the same time, we need the U.S. to help us with our economic difficulties, such as with the IMF, FATF, and other, other problems. Um, and we haven't helped ourselves uh, by creating internal instability in the country, which uh, I will not go into, uh, perhaps in the Q&A. So the twin challenge that we have uh, at the present time. But again, as in the case of other countries, we have also opportunities. Our greatest opportunity, of course, is the BRI CPEC with China. And that is something which is not debatable in Pakistan. It is accepted that that is a game changer for us and we need to go down this road. But an important aspect of this will be to ensure, first and most importantly, the security of Chinese personnel in Pakistan. And obviously, those countries like India and the US that oppose CPEC have been involved in provoke, promoting and provoking this kind of instability that has led to the attacks that have taken place on Chinese personnel. That we have a that is that we need to overcome. Uh, still, the Chinese are extremely interested in pursuing CPEC and in fact in enhancing CPEC to include Afghanistan. And that provides us with a tremendous opportunity. We also need to be able to work with Russia. And I'm, I'm sorry to say that an opportunity that presented itself, for instance, uh, during the visit of the previous prime minister to, to Russia, in a point of controversy, unfortunately, I think. And the opportunity that we had, as India has, to obtain Russian oil at concessionary prices has been squandered. Perhaps there is still room to revive that kind of arrangement. Let us see what we can do. We can also look, I would say, if we are bold enough, uh, we can also try and see if it is possible to have an I, uh, uh, the, the Russian North-South pipeline going through Pakistan. Uh, but that, again, requires a considerable amount of political uh, determination uh, at home. Um, and I think that there are opportunities in this environment to promote our relations with Iran, primarily because the interests of Pakistan, Russia, China, and Iran converge in Afghanistan because of the, the, the shared objective of eventual Afghan stability and the prospects for regional connectivity. So these are very key play points that we need to use given Pakistan's pivotal location, which we can use as leverage uh, to pursue a more balanced policy with the, with the major parts. The, the last word I want to say on this is that while we pursue our relations with the US, we should not do so in a way that our relations with the Chinese or the Russians or the Iranians will be compromised. This will, of course, involve a lot of diplomatic uh, balancing. It will involve uh, very uh, difficult choices, but we need to be able to pursue such a balanced policy uh, for the sake of our longer term, uh, larger security interests. So uh, I'll end on this note and uh, I look forward to the questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Zamir Akram, for such a comprehensive take on so many issues uh, regarding geostrategic environment and the emerging new world order, as you called it. Uh, uh, as uh, you guys may know, please raise your hand and then I will uh, 
call you out and please introduce yourself and keep your uh, questions and comments short and then uh, the ambassador can answer them. Uh, first, uh, Javad Alisha, would you please go ahead? Uh, all right. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Zamir Akram, for the insightful presentation. Uh, I am research assistant at CIA AAAS Karachi, and I have a short question. Uh, sir, do you see uh, Iran as a viable alter alternate for Europe in terms of oil and gas imports? Um, there are several problems there, here. Um, I think one of the possibilities is, uh, is that Iran can be part of a larger group of oil suppliers. Uh, because as you know, uh, the output that Iran can ensure uh, does not compare the output of the Russians. Uh, and the Russians already have a established infrastructure uh, to supply oil and gas to Europe. Uh, the U.S. has demonstrated its preference to deal with Saudi Arabia, with the UAE as energy suppliers, but not Iran, because obviously Iran is a country with which they have major difficulties. So I don't think that Iran can fill in that void, that Iran can be able to uh, provide that kind of, uh, as you say, alternative source of energy to you. We have with us Imran Abbas. Uh, Imran, would you please go ahead and ask your question for the ambassador? Uh, thank you, Excellency, for a, such a comprehensive presentation. I am Imran Abbas, Assistant Professor, Department of Politics and International Relations, University of Sargoda. So my question is that given this term geostrategic, uh, the word geostrategy probably needs to be replaced by the word uh, geoeconomics as all these countries are bound to have dependency on each other and having a huge bilateral trade uh, that is taking place between them. So on the one side, we see the Chinese BRI project. And on the other side, we also see a European recent project of uh, global gateway uh, that is also meant to integrate the world. So it's, it's an, it's, there exists an intention of integrating the global uh, community through economics. So do you see that given that we are at a saturation level of military prowess on the either side, that a military confrontation among the major power at least is not possibility. And then the given that the demography of the world requires all powers to unite, so hence the geoeconomics is a possibility of a win-win situation instead of a geopolitics, uh, geoeconomics is a win-win situation instead of geopolitics as a zero-sum game. Thank you. Okay, thank uh, I want to answer your question in two parts. First, one, one part is the part relating to the, the, you may call it the theoretical side or the, the framework of this whole thing, argument. You know, as a student of international relations and strategic studies, which I have done at, uh, at university, and uh, I've been a part of this, this game for my entire career, <clears throat> 35, 36 years, my conviction is that there is no such thing, there is no such dividing line, nor should there be a dividing line between so-called geostrategy or geopolitics and geoeconomics. Uh, I know that our last government came up with a with a paper, with a uh, with a document on Pakistan's uh, foreign and strategic uh, choices, policies, if you remember. And I, and I was involved in this process and one of uh, and my point there was, it is all about strategy. It is all about geopolitics. And economics is a part of that overall construct of geopolitics. So you can 
include economics, you can include democracy, human rights, freedom, etc. All these kind of questions, uh, they come part of that. And in the end of the day, it is geopolitics that overcomes everything. That's my view. Uh, you may, may not agree, but that's how I look at it. And even if you have, uh, as you mentioned, um, alternative approaches, such as the European approach, at the end of the day, you will see that if, if there is a clash, a contradiction, between geopolitical interests and geoeconomic interests, the geopolitical interests will be will triumph. They will be the ones that will determine the outcome of this uh, of this confrontation. That's that's uh, one thing. The other thing is that the the Europeans have come up with all this uh, these different approaches. Uh, to economic integration, international economic cooperation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The first question that I have about it is, where's the money? China is sitting on bil not billions but trillions of reserves. The U.S. and its Western uh, partners put together cannot match those reserves. So where's the money? Where is it going to come from? The third point is that looking at it from the Chinese perspective, they have always been arguing that they are ready to work with the Europeans, even with the Americans, on a joint basis in this, in this field. So don't, I mean, when, we, okay, when you talk about BRI or when you talk about even of CPEC, you know that the Chinese have been saying it from the very beginning that it does not ex it does not exclude anyone. They say that anyone who is willing to participate is willing is welcome to participate in this project. The opposition has come from the U.S. and because of the U.S. from some other countries, and that's where the geopolitics comes in. So. Yes, it's very good to talk about these kind of things, but to translate them into reality, you have to overcome the, 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 the underlying problem of geopolitics. Thank you so much, uh, Master Akram. There's a question in the chat section from Ahmed Ali, who's a final year undergrad student at National Defense University. He says, I have a question regarding the new partnership between Israel, India, UAE, and the USA named I2U2, although this partnership aims at economic cooperation, but do you think that it is another initiative to counter China in the Middle East? And do you think that I2U2 is likely to include defense cooperation in the future? Thank you. I think this partnership is aimed against Iran. And yes, extension also Iran's relations with China can, can, can be impacted. But the one factor that brings least three of the parties together, that is the United States, the UAE and Israel together, is opposition to Iran and in particular to the possibility that Iran may develop a nuclear weapons capability. So that's the fundamental reason. India is not necessarily anti-Iran because they have good relations with the Iranians and they are buying oil from the Iranians. All this is true. But for them, this is an opportunity to increase their footprint in the larger Middle East region and replace basically the relationship that Pakistan has had with the UAE and with the uh, with with the Saudis or with the other Arab countries, uh, so that is that is their motivation for joining. So it's, for the Indians, it's not necessarily Iran, but it is 
The motivation is to increase India's footprint uh, in the region as a regional power. Thank you. Uh, Faiz Ali, would you like to ask the question? Uh, Fez, uh, we cannot hear you. Now I am audible. Yes, you are. Please go ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, as you said that uh, Pakistan is now facing challenges, uh, balance, uh, uh, balancing its relationship between US and China. And now as we know that uh, China do not have, does not have any military arrangement like NATO or AUKUS, uh, in future, uh, do you think that China will arrange uh, such kind of uh, military alliances and uh, will Pakistan uh, join it or do you think it is not good option for Pakistan as we have very good uh, economic and military and uh, military relationship with uh, China? China has never pursued a policy of creating military alliances. And even bilaterally, uh, even though Pakistan and China have a very extensive military to military relationship, uh, we do not have a military or a defense pact as such. The reason is because the Chinese were the victims of military alliances like CETO that were uh, created by the United States. And at and uh, the precursor, uh, you can say, to AUKUS, which is still there, it's called the ANZUS Pact, which is between the United States, Australia, and New Zealand uh, in, the, in the Pacific. So the Chinese view such alliances as, uh, to use their terminology, imperialist, colonialist uh, policies, which they reject. And so it is not their intention, it, it is not part of their framework, their strategic talk to set up such kind of military alliances. We have uh, Jamal Nasir sir. would you please go ahead and ask the question? Thanks. Uh, sir, thanks for your enlightenment on this the, on the subject. Um, sir, my question is that uh, regarding the influence of uh, China in global and as well as in Asia. Uh, sir, after the uh, crisis of economic meltdown in Sri Lanka, uh, which are being attributed to factors like COVID as well as Chinese investment in the Sri Lanka, do you think other countries in the world would uh, reduce this Chinese investment and Chinese in influence would be reduced globally as well as in Asia? Because uh, sitting in Pakistan, I would not buy this narrative that China is responsible for this economic meltdown. But a citizen, uh, sitting in Africa might be influenced by this narrative. Uh, what do you think, sir? I think this is a false narrative. And uh, as you said, I, am, uh, I agree with you completely that China cannot be held responsible because the facts speak for themselves. Uh, I have seen a report that was written uh, less than a year ago by Americans, by, I forget the name, but uh, they, the, 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 the point of this report analysis is that this whole issue of the so-called Chinese debt burden is a myth. And it is a myth both in regard to Sri Lanka as well as with regard to Pakistan. Because in Pakistan also, uh, some quarters uh, have fallen for this uh, Western-sponsored IMF-backed narrative that Chinese loans uh, have created a debt trap 
for con developing countries like Pakistan and, and Sri Lanka. The reality is that the Sri Lankan debt, just as the Pakistani debt, is the majority of this debt, almost 75 to 80 percent of this debt is owed to the IMF and Western donors rather than to the Chinese. And Chinese debt is also a result of bad economic decisions by the recipient countries, including our own, where we entered into commercial loans on very high rates with Chinese commercial lenders. That is our fault. And that was the, the Sri Lankan's fault. But as I said, the bulk of the, the debt by our countries is owed to the IMF. Almost 75 to 80 percent of the debt is owed to the IMF and other Western donors. I, I did study on this a question of this uh, Sri Lankan Hanban Tota port. And the Sri Lankans themselves told me that this port was originally conceived by Western companies. And they were the ones who started the construction. And it was after they, midway, when they backed out of this Hanban Tota fort in, uh, port in, uh, in Sri Lanka, that the Sri Lankans had to turn to the Chinese for uh, funding this project. So these kind of accusations uh, are made without any kind of substantive facts being put out there to back up these claims. And people, unfortunately, are willing to accept these kind of arguments uh, without question, uh, which I would very strongly suggest to everyone uh, that we should not accept anything without questioning uh, those, those facts. Thank you, Master. Uh, Arsalan Mehdi, would you please go ahead? Hello, sir. I am Arsalan Mehdi. Uh, I am a graduate of School of Politics and International, Univers International Relations, Faisal University, Islamabad. Sir, my question is related to China's rise in the current world order. So when we analyze Chinese behavior, we see two approaches. One is China. One is China tries to, or China's, China is within the institutions of current world order, like UN, like Security Council. Second is China is developing exclusive, is developing or has already developed exclusive institutions outside the current world order, uh, like sir, SCO, like CISA. Under the pretext of these developments, how do you think China will impact the future of current world, current world order? Okay, so first and foremost, we need to understand that there is no contradiction between the United Nations Charter and the UN established order and regional organizations like SCO or other organizations. There is no contradiction. In fact, the UN Charter does not, uh, does not uh, oppose such uh, associations uh, at a regional level or global level. So there is no contradiction between these uh, between these organizations and the UN. The second thing is that the US, uh, as I mentioned in my talk, is trying to promote an international order or to preserve an international order, which is beyond and above and beyond the requirements, obligations of the United Nations Charter. What are they asking for in Asia, in their so-called rules-based order? They're asking that there should be respect for democracy, respect for human rights, freedom of navigation, freedom of air uh, flights. These are not, on the face of it, objectionable Object, uh, objectionable demands or objectionable ideas. But when you pursue this so-called rules-based order on a selective basis, what is the selective basis? 
it is the basis that only those countries that are so called democracies can be a part of this order so you have apart from the united states you have japan you have australia and you have india so called democracies but if you are talking about a rules based order in the asia pacific which is a huge area then everyone who has in this region should be a partner if they are not and if they are deliberately kept out of this arrangement that means that this arrangement is going and can be used against those who are being kept out because they are so called not democratic so this is a difficult uh, and there are contradiction here between these objectives this this rules based order and if you want the human rights charter because when you say that so and so is a democrat and so and so is an autocrat or a or a dictatorship you are interfering in that country's internal affairs which is contrary to the un charter which very clearly says that there should be no interference in the internal affairs of countries number 1 number 2 there is a difference between stated objectives and real objectives as a student of this subject you should know that you do know i'm sure that you are not that a country is not going to say that i am going to pursue this objective because i want to uh, contain china i want to confront it and i want you know keep it keep it under my thumb and not allow it to emerge as a competitor they're not going to say this that is not their declaratory policy the declaratory policy is that you know we we want to ensure this based order we want all this thing but the real objective is that we are going to get together with these countries and keep the chains down as far as as much as we can that will never be stated but as students of the subject we know what is the reality and what why things are being done in the way they are being done so we need to realize the the difference between declaratory policy and real policy thank you so much uh, ambassador there's a question from rabia rehman she says she's a she's done a bachelor's in international relations from international university islamabad and she says that her question is regarding the existing global order do you see that disintegrate uh, disintegration of european union as euro skepticism is rising um i don't see the disintegration of the european union uh because i think that it is already quite badly damaged and the and and, and it, ha it has been badly damaged by brexit by the by the withdrawal of the united kingdom from from the european union uh and as a result of that the major european powers like germany and france i have got together to ensure that they that there is no further uh disintegration or or deterioration in the european union um and the other smaller european countries luxembourg belgium the denmark uh, holland denmark all the other these countries are heavily dependent greece for instance italy these countries are heavily dependent on the european union for their economic well being uh, the the european uh, trade agreement the, the arrangements for travel all those things these are are beneficiaries these are beneficial to the european union members uh so i don't think that that europe the european union will disintegrate it may become weak it has already become weak with the with the exit from of the united kingdom uh but i i don't see 
the European Union disintegrating as such. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Uh, Murad Ali, would you like to ask a question, please? Uh, first of all, uh, thank you so much, sir, for having such an insightful presentation. So uh, my question is regarding, sir, the Quad and it's relevant for Pakistan. The Indian Ocean uh, part of the Quad is, uh, we know, is a matter of high concern for Pakistan. Since Pakistan maintained 90% of trade through seaborne with the uh, two strategic ports like Karachi and Gawadar. And secondly, India naval power, as we've been witnessing, is outpacing Pakistan's uh, which is an alarming factor for Pakistan to secure its trade route from uh, interference in the in a time of uh, crisis, probably. So my question is, do you think that the position of China in the uh, Indian Ocean region will fulfill Pakistan's security needs in the future? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, I think that it is extremely important uh, that Pakistan and China maintain close cooperation in the Indian Ocean, especially to ensure freedom of navigation. Uh, the Arabian Sea, the Persian Gulf, uh, these are all parts of the Indian Ocean and it is absolutely critical that we remain, uh, uh, that, that the, these areas are not dominated uh, by any country such as India, which, which as you are rightly pointing out, is trying its best to do. Um, and I think that uh, we have already uh, uh, engaged in the kind of cooperation with China that is needed to ensure our uh, maritime security. And I think that uh, as the time goes on, uh, this cooperation will increase. As you know, uh, we have cooperated with China for, for submarines and for other uh, equipment. So I think that that uh, it, it is absolutely vital that we, uh, in the years ahead, we ensure uh, in our partnership with the Chinese, uh, ma the maritime security, Pakistan's maritime security, which is also in the Chinese interest, which is why from, from my point of view, the Gwadar port, operationalization of the Gwadar, Gwadar port is so strategically important because it will ensure long-term Chinese commitment to the freedom of navigation in this, uh, in this region. Thank you, sir. Um, I, I think Ali Mustafa's mic, uh, uh, maybe his connection has dropped. Uh, if I'm audible, sir, we'd like you to take another question. Uh, Imran, uh, Imran Abbas, could you please go ahead and uh, ask your question? Uh, thank you, Excellency. Uh, my question is about uh, the given impression of the Pakistan's foreign policy uh, in this contemporary period is about having a strategic confusion. Do you agree with the notion? And uh, can Pakistan actually emulate what the Indians and the Turkish are doing when they are provided with the options of US, Russia, and China, that we can balance out these options and it would be easier for us or it's a, it's a very daunting task to achieve? Thank you. So you have asked a very good question uh, and a very difficult question. Unfortunately, I uh, have no say in the formulation of Pakistan's foreign policy. Uh, but I would very strongly urge our foreign policy makers, first and foremost, to get out of this minds, this Western mindset. This has been a mindset that has existed, I would say, since our independence. Uh, we have always looked towards the West, even when we have been let down by the West time and time again in terms of our security. Uh, 
this requires first and foremost a national consensus on our security interests, on our long-term security interests. Actually, we are not even yet agreed on what our long-term security interests should be. Our foreign policy has been on incremental basis and it has been reactive, reacting to crises. We do not have a long-term plan. Where do we want to go? What is our objective? Where do we see Pakistan? That is called grand strategy. We don't have a grand strategy. Because if you had a grand strategy and you knew where we are going to go, we would then need to develop the capabilities to make that possible, to achieve that objective. That was one of my major problems with this, uh, the last government's uh, policy paper that they came up with. Uh, because they talked about geoeconomics and they talked about everything, but they didn't really clearly identify what is our strategic objective. So, uh, if, if we are clear about that, then we can and we should take use, make use of all the opportunities that come our way. And we should be flexible and we should be agile in changing. Let, I, let me give you, give you an example. I was still in service when the Cold War ended, 1991. In fact, I was in our embassy in India in those days. There was a stark difference between our reaction and the Indian reaction. We continue to hold on to the hope that the US will continue to be our friend and partner as it was during the Afghan war, which ended in 1989. We were wrong. We did, not, we did not take into account that the world had changed. The war in Afghanistan had ended, the Soviet Union had withdrawn, it had collapsed, it had disintegrated by 1991. The Americans did not need us as they did during the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan. This strategic reality was staring us in the face, but we still continue to believe that Americans are our great friends and allies. I won't go into the details, but this is broadly what happened. On the other side of the border, when the Indians saw the Soviet Union collapse, they immediately turned gears, shifted gears, and ended their, their decades-long animosity with Washington. They to the extent of Israel immediately because they knew that that would open doors for them in Washington. So uh, this is what I mean by, by looking at strategic change. Now, in the present environment, they're still looking towards Washington to help bail us out with IMF and FTF and other things because of economic difficulties that we have ourselves created and we are not ready to pay the price to put our house in order, which means we are not ready to make the structural reforms that will end the elite capture of our economy. That is the only way that we can generate enough resources to meet the gap with our expenditures and, end, and stop us and, and, and prevent us from going to the IMF to, to, to uh, Buy, to get loans to, to, to bridge the gap between expenditure and revenue. We are not ready to make that sacrifice. At least the elite of our country, the ruling elite of our country, are not willing to make that sacrifice. And we are still clinging on to this hope that somehow Washington will come to our help. It won't. Unless, of course, they ask you, they will ask you to do things which you can't do. 
so this is the whole problem and and uh, we don't if we had a goal if we had a clear cut idea that we we are talking this game you know we are, we talk this game of following a balanced foreign policy but we don't implement the balance your previous prime minister goes to uh, to russia and everybody criticizes him for going to russia at the wrong time look at in america's close ally in uh, uh, our neighbor india they are still an ally but they are buying russian oil at discounted prices and they are telling the americans that this is in our national interest so unless you re are ready to play play this kind of hard ball this requires spine it requires guts it requires you to play hard ball and pakistan is not a weak country it's a it's a nuclear power you should start acting like a nuclear power instead of like a beggar going from pillar to post begging with a begging bowl to help us overcome our current deficit so you know this is a state of mind i started by saying this is a state of mind we have to change the, our mindset thank you so much uh, master akram uh, my apologies for the sporadic uh, joining in and leaving uh, i'm having internet difficulties uh, if i may just take uh, a bit of privilege as a moderator uh, i would like to segue into uh, something that you talked about before uh there's this new military uh and economic architecture rising in the middle east uh, especially especially you talked about that india is trying to replace uh or at least influence the classical pakistani role in the middle east and you see new alliances being formed against iran uh, in terms of us saudis emiratis and the israelis coming together uh is it time to revisit our israel uh decision and uh, think about opening up our ties with israel or do you think that in doing so it would um uh, perhaps affect our moral standing on the issues of kashmir palestine and other uh, muslim questions uh, all over the world thank you i think that the time has gone to mend fences with israel because in the present environment israel is no longer interested in relations with pakistan there was a time in the late 90s early 2000s when the israelis were interested but for different reasons we were not willing although we made some tentative steps prime minister bhutto made some tentative steps benazir bhutto made some tentative steps took some tentative steps president musharraf took some tentative Step, but uh, we did not follow through. But that time is gone. Now uh, there is a strategic partnership for some years now between India and Israel. And Israel will not want to sacrifice its strategic relations with India for the sake of Pakistan. So that's the bottom line. The other, and that is the real. I mean, that is real politics. The other part about principles, yes, very important. uh very important principles are for uh a principle of self determination a principle of uh of uh of uh, of the rights of the palestinians all those things are very important uh still there was a time when uh we could have taken a position that could have also taken care of our principles by saying that because at that time in the late in the mid late 90s early 2000s there was a time when the international community along with pakistan uh, had voted for uh, a two state solution for the israeli palestinian problem which the israelis had accepted uh, and on that basis we could have said yes okay we will we can recognize your uh, your government as long as you implement the agreement uh, and 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 we will solve but now that is also gone uh, i think these these uh, these likud people who are fanatics zionists they are not interested in this uh, two state solution 
they have marginalized uh, the Palestinians and they have uh, used the Iranian card, uh, scared the Arabs into recognizing or having uh, better relations with Israel. So uh, now the game is different. But at this stage, I don't see any real benefit for us coming out of this. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Ekram. Uh, there's a question from Sikandar Azam Khan uh, in the chat. He said, my question is, what policy options does Pakistan have in the recent invasion of Ukraine? I think we should be very clear. Instead of going around saying that the Russians have invaded uh, Ukraine and that the Russians have are terrible people, uh, all this kind of thing, we don't need to say. Uh, at, at one level, we have taken the right decisions. We have not joined the resolutions in the UN Security Council and the Human Rights Council and other UN bodies uh, to, condemn, uh, the, to condemn Russia. That's the right thing to do. Uh, but we don't have to go around publicly criticizing the Russians. We can say that we are opposed to any form of interference and aggression by any country. And we should recall that those that are accusing the Russians today are themselves guilty of having invaded and intervened in countries around the world. And so they are hardly in a position to criticize Russia. The other thing we need to say is that while we are opposed to Russia's intervention in Ukraine, we also understand, we also appreciate India, uh, Russia's security concerns. And there needs to be a political solution taking into account those Russian security concerns. I think that is a balanced policy and it, it is the correct policy uh, in the circumstances. Thank you. Uh, Shayan Hassan, would you go ahead and ask your question? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, and thank you to Ambassador Zimir Akram for the very informative lecture. Uh, sir, you mentioned uh, Kishore Mabubani's prediction that you know the US and China will clash 100% over the Taiwan issue. Uh, so sir, it would seem that uh, this would favor the US in, in a lot of ways because China is playing the waiting game. You know, China has the 2049 plan where it wants to reintegrate uh, Taiwan back into mainland China by 2049. So could we say that uh, the US policy of containment of China is a sort of way of provoking you know, China into an early clash before 2049? And so also, uh, if there is a, a clash over Taiwan between the US and China, would it play out in the same vein as Ukraine has? Thank you. Okay. Um, interesting question. Um, I recently read uh, an article, a long uh, article in the New York Times, written by some uh, American, I forget their name. But this article argued that the US is not militarily capable of preventing the Chinese from taking military action against Taiwan. Now, I don't know how far this is true because, of course, the United States is still the world's most powerful country uh, and it can uh, bring to bear uh, massive force against China. But as time goes on, uh, China is also developing its capabilities and this is what the, uh, the article was arguing, that in terms of naval, with the exception of aircraft carriers, the Chinese have far more naval vessels than the United States. Uh, and it also argued that in any case, due to geographic proximity, China doesn't need to have aircraft carriers in that region. Uh, and then it also went on to point out that uh, one or even two American aircraft carriers would be highly vulnerable to Chinese submarines, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, this is a kind of military uh, argument which you can make in either case, 
whatever happens. But the more important thing is strategically. Strategically, and you have hinted to that, the Chinese are not willing to squander their economic development gains and objectives at this time. So yes, you can make an argument that the Americans may try to provoke some kind of military action, but that would be a highly dangerous move on the part of the United States. And in the present circumstances, what has Ukraine demonstrated is that the Americans' focus from the Clinton times to the present has been ex almost exclusively to, re to, uh, to uh, contain China because they have always calculated that the greatest threat to their uh, status as a global power comes from China. Now they have embroiled themselves by provoking the Russians into an aggression in Ukraine. So that leaves the Chinese as the net winner among the three. While the Russians and the Chi Americans are expending their resources and they're fighting in Ukraine, the Chinese are benefiting. But that's not a good strategic move from the part of the United States. Um, so it would, I would say, it's, it would be disastrous if the Americans decided that while the, the Ukraine war uh, has not re been resolved and, and some kind of solution has not emerged, uh, to try and provoke a confrontation with China at the same time in a different theater in Asia. That would be disastrous. So it's a, it's a very difficult, difficult question to answer, as I said in the beginning. Uh, one would, it, would be, it would be hazardous to make a guess uh, about who will come out on top if there is a conflict uh, over time on in the present time. Thank you so much, uh, sir. Uh, Faraz, uh, do you have a question? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, sir, sir Mustafa. Um, and thank you, Ambassador Akram, for a very interesting um, talk. My question is somewhat related to what Shayan asked, uh, kind of in, uh, localized like, in the context of Pakistan. So you mentioned and uh, you referred to uh, Sir Mehubani's prediction that a conflict is almost certain between uh, America and China. So let's assu uh, assuming that that certainty will happen and there will be some conflict. And given how you've mentioned that our foreign policy has been reactive for the longest of times, so the possibility of us taking a proactive and forward-looking foreign policy is less. With this context, how long can we go on with uh, trying to walk the rope between the great powers? To what at what point will we? be forced to make a de decision between aligning or leaning towards one major power, the US or the other uh, with China? Like how long can we sustain this um, uh, tightrope foreign policy between the, two, uh, between the two countries? Thank you. This, uh, I think the, the, the choice for us is very clear and my uh, uh, argument has, has been that with China, we have very clear convergence of strategic interests. Regional connectivity through CPEC and BRI is very important for us. We are engaged in extensive defense cooperation with the Chinese. Our diplomatic relations are very strong where we come to each other's support and assistance in international organizations and in international other international fora. So there is an obvious convergence. The other convergence in a kind of geostrategic sense is that 
as us india relations or us india strategic partnership develops and becomes uh, uh, grows similarly <laughs> the pakistan china convergence against india also increases because the chinese in response need to work with pakistan to ensure that china that india does not pursue aggressive policies towards china or towards pakistan so that again is another yet another area of convergence for these reasons i don't see a balance or i don't see that there is a similar convergence between the united states and i i i would say that primarily because of what happened in afghanistan the us is not prepared to really engage with pakistan up beyond a certain point and that certain point is confined to soft areas soft areas climate change health education some trade perhaps but not in the hard areas no military cooperation no political cooperation and those kind of things except for counter terrorism cooperation and so we have to deal with what we've got have to be realistic we should not have unrealistic uh, expectations from washington you know in the previous government people used to always say that the american president has not called the prime minister yes obviously he hasn't called the prime minister because for 20 years from the american point of view pakistan the way the americans define it pakistan was helping the taliban who were giving the americans a hard time and eventually uh, forced them to retreat from afghanistan and so we didn't make any win any friends in in washington or anywhere else in the united states so there was no reason why they would call and say hello how are you doing and we have, you know we are very very good friends no so it is unrealistic to expect that yes what they can and they will and perhaps they already have asked is to give is to engage in some kind of counter terrorism cooperation and if you see the papers today you see this latest report by the united nations which talks about resurgence of al qaeda the emergence of isk the ttp all these things and then there are other count, uh, smaller count, uh, terrorist out, outfits like the eastern turkestan islamic movement the ium the islamic movement uh, of afghanistan uh, of uzbekistan and so many others so there there is a convergence and so we have to bear down that convergence without having to compromise our national security in in the process i think uh, those are enough reasons where we can balance this relationship maybe not balance it but at least not allow this relationship to go into cold storage those are the openings those are the cards that we have that we should play and maybe perhaps better sense will prevail in the world and uh, the us will give up its pursuit of global hegemony and and uh, its zero sum game and perhaps in the future sometime us china relations can uh, become better thank you uh, master uh, there's a question from adila ahmed and she's a phd scholar in ir from the university of lahore uh, she asks what is your take on pakistan's hedging policy uh, how do you view, view this uh, Uh, how, how do you view this way to pursue national interest in a dynamic global environment uh, your insight please um would you uh, 
could you ask the 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 questioner to kindly explain what i mean give an example what they what do they mean by hedging policy towards whom sure uh, adila would you please kindly uh, if you can unmute your mic and ask this question please yeah. go ahead uh, okay uh, am i audible yes am i audible okay yes yes uh, actually uh, pakistan hedging policy regarding a uh, nuclear program uh, pakistan nuclear program that how pakistan in the past used this as uh, you are you are mentioning again again about the pakistan approach to pursue their objective through balanced approach so uh, so i want to know your take that uh, in pakistan use hedging policy as well and how they use it but i don't think that there's been any hedging um on uh, as so far as our nuclear policy is concerned our nuclear policy is very clear it is meant for credible deterrence against india and we are not threatening anyone else with our nuclear capability we developed this capability in response to india's nuclear weapons capability and it is india centric it's india focused and so i don't see how uh, one can uh, characterize that as hedging uh yes the word hedging has been used in a different context that is uh, what you are referring to and, and that context has been in afghanistan when the us argued that we should not only crack down on al qaeda but also on the afghan taliban and we were reluctant to do that because we knew that once the americans leave we would have to deal with the taliban uh, the afghan taliban uh, in afghanistan so yes that in that sense the americans have said that we have followed a policy a policy of hedging our bets and i think that that was the correct policy and it has proved to be the correct policy as events have demonstrated thank you uh, ambassador akram um imran abbas would you want to go ahead uh thank you very much excellency uh, my question actually uh, takes up a precursor to a very well known phrase that the region exists where politician want them to exist and Sorry, given can you the, repeat that uh, uh the region exist where politicians want them to exist it's not merely geography actually it's the will political will that they can create even a region out of nowhere like the brics so uh taking this into a pretext i just want to ask that only a decade ago the geo strategic environment and deliberations were centered around the great game the new great game and the great park in with regard to the central area and pakistan was considered as the best beneficiary out of that likely and possibly so now the given situation has changed that equation and we seems to have caught between the devil and the deep sea do you think that pakistan can revive a project like eco or is it a dead horse sir well you know eco was not much of a horse to begin with so if it is dead or not is a separate question but eco never delivered uh, better than eco is sco the shanghai cooperation organization although i will not i do not i do not subscribe the, to the view that we should abandon the the economic cooperation organization we should we should try and uh, promote whatever uh, cooperation is possible but coming to your main uh, question i don't think that the great game has ended uh one phase of that is ended we are now in a new phase but the great game in central asia south asia west asia is still very much on new players the americans have exited but maybe they have not exited for a very long time maybe they will come back in some form or shape uh but right now i think the great game uh, actually 
with the exception or with the uh, with the with the, uh, apart from the problem of stability and of instability in afghanistan the prospects for regional connectivity in this region uh, between pakistan china central asian republics russia and even iran uh, the possibilities have improved considerably after the end of the 20 year war in afghanistan so i think the great game has entered a new chapter and and uh, we should certainly work uh, with countries that have convergent interests with us particularly the three the uh, as i mentioned russia and china and central asian countries we should work with them uh, to try and promote a more stable uh, environment in afghanistan which can create or which can enable the creation of uh, a, a more re better regional connectivity there is some already there uh, some uh, road connectivity uh, is there but uh, we can uh, certainly this will the, the chances for that can improve uh, considerably once afghanistan is stable and, and as i mentioned in my talk uh, only yesterday the foreign secretary and the chinese head of cpec uh, talked about the possibility of extending cpec to afghanistan uh, which would be an extremely positive thing uh, not only for regional connectivity but also to help stabilize afghanistan through economic development of that country thank you uh, there's a question in the comments by rubab nawaz she's a student of international relations at the uh, national defense university she asks what would uh, what it would be the uh, impact of climate change on global as well as regional geostrategic environment and she's asking specific to us china competition in the arctic and pakistan india's joint water management under the indus water treaty this is a tragedy of our times that uh, we are still i mean this whole uh, when we are talking about the emerging geostrategic order uh, this is all focused on power uh, power competition competition for greater influence uh, control etc but we are not looking at issues that present a transnational threat uh, which it is in the interest of all the countries uh, the global community uh, to to jointly address them uh, you have mentioned climate change i would say health the, such as the pandemic that we are going through uh, right now uh, these are two very key issues uh, that need to be dealt with um, I, I remember when I was uh, serving as ambassador in uh, my last post in the UN in Geneva, uh, <clears throat> an entirely new area of diplomacy has emerged called health diplomacy, just as climate diplomacy has emerged. These are new areas um, and we need to focus uh, on, uh, on overcoming these transnational challenges. Now, as far as uh, climate change is concerned, there is a shared problem or a shared threat of the melting of the glaciers, the overheating of the subcontinent as we have witnessed uh, in the recent past with temperatures, unprecedented temperatures, uh, which has caused glacial melt, all those. Uh, and these are environmental hazards there is an organization you will be surprised to know called ec mode and this is based in kathmandu and it and it it uh, it is involved in promoting cooperation between the countries that have the himalayas the karakorams and the pamirs and the hindu kush these four ranges uh, all the countries that have these mountain ranges uh, are members of this um, of this organization but unfortunately this organization has not been able to do very much in terms of cooperation uh, 
to 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 address these challenges uh, because these efforts have overshadowed political problems by political differences uh, and, and so as long as that exists that uh, this kind of issue would not would not uh, it would not be possible to address these climate change water sharing we have an agreement for a long time an agreement brokered by the world bank the indus basin treaty the indus waters treaty but unfortunately we have seen our neighbor violating that treaty uh, by interpreting it in ways that they want to interpret it it uh, it basically requires a recognition by the leaderships of all the countries involved that there is a greater threat than what we are ready to admit uh, that is posed by climate change and that while our problems and our disputes uh, will be there uh, we still need to work towards addressing those problems now at the global level uh, mr biden when he came when he was elected uh, said that there the american relationship with china would be based on issues it would be an issue based relationship where there would be uh opposition or con not con we didn't say confrontation but uh challenges uh, uh, on political issues but there would also be opportunities to to cooperate such as on climate change but that hasn't happened uh fortunately that still remains uh, a part of the of the you know the 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 declaratory policy rather than the real policy uh, between the us uh, attitude towards china uh, thank you ambassador akram uh, aiza uh, would you like to ask your question please thank you ari uh, assalam alaikum sir i am aiza azam i am the editor in chief of strap asia and also coordinator for this workshop um so my question is uh, it's again it's related to china uh, about a month ago in uh, june mid june uh, president xi signed uh, into law an order for military operations other than war essentially it created a legal basis for the uh, for the liberation army the pla's activities um in this i'm sorry can, can you activity. repeat because there's some i can't hear all the word everything that you said can you repeat that please and certainly am i able to speak a bit loud loudly Am I audible now? Yeah, you are audible, but just speak a bit loudly. I will. So, um, last month, President Xi Jinping signed into law an order uh, for military operations other than war. Uh, what it basically does is it creates legal basis for the Chinese uh, military's activities in peacekeeping, plus relief, humanitarian aid, etc. And China has already been taking part in these activities, including with the UN. but the fact that it comes right on the heels of its engagement with the solomon islands and plus this uh, order specifically talks about china's uh, security and development interests and also world peace and regional security so do you think this is um, china signaling that it's going to be more assertive in terms of intention in the region and beyond um sorry um, i apologize uh, could i ask the moderator to please read out the question because the voice breaks in between and i i can't i couldn't understand the full question sure aiza would you kindly type this um and uh, so that i can um, ask someone else to ask a question now and then you may type it and then i can ask it afterwards would that be possible sure she aiza will type it out Uh, so let's just take another question and then we'll come back to aiza uh, fazal elahi bilal would you please like to ask your question first is i am audible now yes you are hello i am audible now yes you are okay uh, first of all thank you uh, first of all thank you to Excellency the Mirakum Sir to provide a very good overall subject. So my question is a related reference to the U.S. policy towards China called Contain China Strategy. On three point, first to present India as a counterweight to China. 
secondly the establishment of collateral security dialogue commission consists of australia japan china and india uh, lastly the south sea china as a theater of major problem for uh, beijing so what would you think uh, what will be the consequences of this us policy or approach generally to the region and particularly to the cpec thank you sir well you know i i mentioned in my talk that the us is following a zero sum policy with regard to both its competing powers the the chinese and the russians and uh, ever since the rise of china the chinese have tried to pursue what they call a win win cooperation and a peaceful rise for china whereas on the other side the us uh, has tried to create these alliances that you mentioned <clears throat> like uh, the quadrilateral alliance and uh, and aukus and others uh to contain the to china uh, the, to contain china now the fact is that these alliances uh are creating tensions in the region and between the major play players the major powers as i mentioned in my talk the the chinese have uh, referred to aukus as the asian nato so they see this as a military alliance rather than as a alliance for other kind of purposes uh and it is meant to contain china which the chinese are not ready to accept and also because the chinese uh feel threatened because almost 80% of their shipping is through the maritime routes uh, of this region in the asia pacific so what the chinese are doing is to create a alternative a strategic option and that is the belt and road initiative which is the kind of backup land route option for china to connect with the rest of the world and the china the chinese as i mentioned has trillions of dollars in reserves that they can use to promote this belt and road initiative uh, not just in central in the eurasian context but also in africa even to latin america so this is a competition that is emerging uh, that has already emerged between the two major powers the united states and and china uh on the other hand the chinese uh, the the americans are also trying to confront the russians uh, as you know and uh, for that reason there is now there has been for some time a strategic partnership between the chinese and the russians which in january of this year the chinese and russians are uh, described as a relationship or partnership with ha which has no limits so uh, open ended uh, partnership this is not a favorable condition uh, for the us and uh, it is not certainly not a favorable uh, outcome for the region because it would be far better uh, globally and regionally if the us Uh, abandoned its zero sum approach and uh, agreed to work uh, together with the us uh, with the chinese and the russians as equal partners that would have a greater impact and a better impact on the global situation which in response to the earlier question as well would enable us or the enable the international community to address the transnational threats Uh, which are common to everyone like climate change or or uh, pandemics and other things uh, so um this is the unfortunate reality uh, that this competition seems to to be there and is likely to go continue thank you uh, master akram the last question from aiza she just typed it now uh, yes. so she she asks last month president xi of china signed into law an order for military operations other than war effectively creating a legal basis for the pla's activities in disaster relief humanitarian aid uh, given that this comes on the heels of the agreement with the solomon islands and the or uh, talks about protecting china's security and development in, uh, interest in world peace as well as regional stability does this mean china is signaling a more assertive approach to physical military intervention which they did not do as a policy before okay so uh, there are several points uh, that need to be uh, taken up here first of all um 
this is nothing new. I mean, this is what China has signaled is something that a power like the United States or even a power like India, uh, Australia and others have already been doing, except they haven't called it uh, military intervention short of war. Uh, they haven't called it that, but they're certainly, if you read the, the, the terms of reference uh, or the mandate of the quadrilateral alliance, one of the issues, one of the fact, uh, one of the areas in which they are going to be working is disaster relief and disaster uh, assistance. And the origins of this quadrilateral alliance are traced to the shared response to the tsunami, if you remember in those, uh, when, the, when the tsunami took place. So uh, what the Chinese are trying to do, now this is the second point is what the Chinese are trying to do is trying is to use their military to extend humanitarian assistance to countries that need such assistance as a consequence of some kind of natural disaster or, or some other kind of uh, difficult situation that they are confronted with. Um, and that they call it as being uh, the using the, uh, the the Chinese or the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, to be able to help in doing that. Um, yes, it can be used by China's uh, opponents to make the case that China is being more assertive. And there is no doubt that China under President Xi is more assertive. Uh, but Again, I would quote Mr. Mehbubani, who is an expert on China, to state that with the exception of the brief Chinese war with Vietnam, when the Vietnamese were threatening Chinese border positions, China has, modern China, has never been to war or invaded any country ever. With, as compared to, if you look at uh, uh, the United States, which in its entire history of over two centuries, more than two centuries, has been at peace for only 17 years. And that is according to President Jimmy Carter himself. So uh, I would not go so far as to say that this denotes uh, it certainly indicates Chinese assertiveness as a regional player, as a global player, but it does not amount to military intervention. It's a, it's a big red line between the two. So I, I would not agree that this amounts to military intervention. Yes, it is assertive. Yes, the Chinese are being assertive, no doubt about it. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Zamir Akram. Uh, this concludes um, uh, the, uh, our, our discussion. Uh, it was such an insightful, incisive, comprehensive, and intellectually stimulating conversation. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your time and for your invaluable wisdom uh, of working and looking into such issues for so many years. Um, I, I'm pretty sure that there are so many other questions that unfortunately time does not allow us. Uh, once again, Thank you so much. And if I may ask all the participants to show our virtual um, clap sign, thumbs up sign for the ambassador uh, and a hearts, uh, that would be lovely. Thank you so much, ambassador, once again. And we hope to see you around. Take care. Thank you. Thank you very much. I enjoyed talking to all of you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, um, so, uh, so, so Ali, are you still there? No, I think he's out. Okay, so just uh, just before we close this session today, uh, just one uh, one quick announcement, just a refresher about uh, tomorrow's session. 
Tomorrow's session is going to be with Dr. Murad Aslan from Turkey on the topic of NATO's expansion. It's the same time and the same Zoom link, 2 to 4 p.m. Pakistan time. So uh, we'll see you all there tomorrow. And thank you to everyone for coming, being very punctual. The attendance was uh, good today. Uh, I don't think anyone came later than a few minutes after. So that's great. And looking forward to hearing you guys' discussion and to the speaker tomorrow. Allah Hafiz. <laughs>